that were here before will come back again, but we'll see. Yep, they're coming back. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to mention to you is about your camera and about learning about your camera. And that's kind of what this boils down to, you know, learning about your camera is to be patient with yourself, okay? Your camera has on it tons and tons of features, all right? You're not going to learn them all in one day. And for a lot of people, it would take you a lifetime to learn all of those features and what they do. So what you sort of need to do is take small steps at a time. And I'm not telling you anything new about learning things, am I? I mean, this is sort of the way everything works. I just don't want you to beat yourself up about your camera. Have fun with it, okay? Play with it. Take lots of pictures. Is there any reason when you go to the next birthday not to take 40 pictures instead of just two? No. No reason, okay? you got to take a lot of pictures to get good pictures. I had a, a guy from Nikon years ago. I went to a seminar, and his big thing was when he went out and shot an afternoon, he didn't come back with one roll of film. He didn't come back with two rolls of film. He came back with 30 and 40 rolls of film. Now, he could afford it. You know, he worked for Nikon. But the point's well taken. You know, you got to take a lot of pictures to get good ones. You've got a camera now that you can do that with. So do that. Take a lot of pictures. Okay, do I, and I'm, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just, you know, passionate about this. So that's that's what I want to say to kind of get started here. Okay, now let's kind of work our way through the camera, and I'm going to give you a couple takeaways with your camera, hopefully that you can use. And I want to start with just saying that, you know, when you take pictures with your camera, and I'm going to bring up get up my bigger one now. When you take pictures with your camera, your pictures immediately are turned into picture files, computer files. Inside of this thing, inside of those little point and shoots, whatever you have, is a computer. And when you take a picture with your camera, that computer saves your picture as a computer file. Would you all agree with that? Okay. Now, when it comes to your camera taking pictures and saving as files. Your files are saved to little computer storage devices that we call media cards. Okay? A lot of you have a computer at home. Is that true? Do quite a few of you have computers? Okay. How many of you have used a flash drive? A flash drive. Okay. Flash drives are like modern day floppy disks, aren't they? They're like what we can we can put into our computer, copy something to them, and take it away. The technology in this little thing here and in the chip that you have in your cameras is Flash. That's the same technology. So this is a little computer storage device. Okay? That's what's inside of your camera. So all of your pictures end up here. Okay? They end up as files on that little chip. Now, as you begin to start looking around your camera, once you know that this, they're going to get saved as files, this is a computer, as you begin to look around, the first thing you're going to want to do is sort of familiarize yourself with what the buttons are out here. Now, there's gobs of buttons, okay? I mean, there are a ton of buttons. Let me just mention a few things about the buttons and some of the more popular ones you're going to run into, okay, that you'll all have in some form or another, okay? And this is a very simple little camera, but it'll serve its purpose, okay? Now, the first thing is, is that if you look, oh, you know what? Hang on. My people are watching me. Who would want to watch me? I need to point them over. Sorry, you webinar people. I didn't put you in the right place here. Uh, here we go. There, now they can see what... <laughs> Now they can see what, oh, oh well. Sorry, you webinar people, but you'll have to all forgive me. Now you can see what I was showing you up on the screen up here. Okay, so let's, let's just look around a little bit. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, that buttons can, can appear different ways on your camera. You know, some of the buttons that you run into are simply going to be push buttons, things you push. Okay. Sometimes they are little back and forth switches. Like if you look here at this, this is kind of hard to see, but this is a little switch that you can push back and forth. These are just push buttons. But a lot of you will have on your camera something that's kind of like this, like a little circle. Okay. Now I want to mention this in particular because a lot of times people don't know how to use this button. But what it is, if you think about this, this is sort of like a rocker switch. 
okay? And if you look at the circle, you'll see that at the points of the compass on the circle, okay, there are different icons which basically tell you what that part is for. You use this by pressing on the point of the compass. So, for example, if I came to this little one right here, do you guys see my mouse moving? Okay, it's a little tiny lightning bolt. The little tiny lightning bolt most commonly is for changing how your flash works. So, for example, let's say that I wanted to turn the flash completely off. My guess is that's the button to go to. Wouldn't you guess that? Okay. To use that button, I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to press on the lightning bolt. Now, again, this circle is like a rocker, okay? And the direction you press is like pressing a single button. A lot of times people don't realize that. Now, a lot of these buttons, when you press them then, you will see on your display, let me get my other camera here, okay? You will literally see on the back of your camera, on this display, something appearing or disappearing showing you what you're doing. So as I press my little lightning bolt, okay, it, it literally takes me through a little menu as I press it. I'm just pressing, 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 and it's just cycling me through the different flash settings. Does that make sense? That's how a lot of these buttons work. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing is to understand this is a rocker, and these buttons here are individual. You press this side, it's one thing. You press this side, it's another. You press this side, it's even another. And as you press, it will usually take you through a series of choices that are displayed right here. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Well, and we'll talk about that. Okay? Now, second thing. Okay? Second thing here. You'll notice, for example, on this camera, that I have some little icons here that are blue, but then I also have, in one place, I've actually got different icons, three of them in one place, and you're thinking, okay, which is it, right? It's like, which feature does that button work for? Because there's more than one listed there. Well, that takes me to say that your camera, at any given time, can be in one of two different modes, M-O-D-E-S. I am either ready to take a picture, I'll call that picture taking mode, or I'm reviewing the pictures that I have taken. You all know how to do that in your camera? How you can, you can look, go back and look and see what you've taken? That is a separate mode. I'm going to call it review mode. Okay? So your camera is either going to be in picture taking mode or review mode. Now, the first thing is, to go back and forth between those modes, you usually have a button of some kind. Sometimes it's in the form of a switch. That's what this switch is right here. The little tiny arrow is review. The little camera is picture taking mode. So I'd either push this upward to take pictures or downwards to review. Some of you have a little button that looks like a little tiny green arrow. That is your mode button. When you press it, you review pictures. You press it again, you're back to your camera. Okay? Now, why is that important? I mean, if you know how to do it, why is it important? Well, here's why it's important. Some of these features that you see on the buttons are only available in certain modes. When you are in review mode, the flash doesn't change. None of this changes over here. But when you get into picture changing mode and you press these, they will work. Okay? Second reason it's important for you to know, am I taking a picture, am I reviewing? You probably have a menu button. Does that ring a bell? Okay. Your menu button usually will display some type of a menu on the LCD with choices on it. The menu is different depending on if you're picture taking or reviewing. You have two different menus. So if you're in review mode and you want to go in and change the way your camera's taking pictures, it ain't going to work. You're not going to see those things. You've got to get over to camera mode before you see those in your menu. Okay? Now, 
Having said that, okay, my point is this, okay, a lot of times in the classes I'll find that people, first of all, just aren't quite sure how to even press these buttons or even how these different things, why do I see these different icons and things? Well, now hopefully that'll help you a little bit. Now, let's look at some specifics here, okay? I'm just going to throw out a couple real specific things here. Again, lightning bolt is for your flash. Most cameras allow you to change the flash from automatic, meaning it goes off whenever it's needed, to always go off, to uh, red eye reduction flash, which hopefully helps you reduce that you know, red eye. And you all know what red eye is, don't you? you know? And then, of course, there's, there's some other flash modes that your camera might have. If you press it, it will cycle through them. Okay? Also, over here, we have a little flower. Can anybody tell me what the flower is for? Pardon me? Good guess, but no. I heard, I heard close up. Yes, and that's typically what it is. The little flower button, for some reason they've standardized on the flower, is for you to take close up pictures. Okay. Normally, most digital cameras, and it's true of most film cameras for that matter, most cameras cannot focus on something that is more than about 32 inches away from it, just the optics of the camera. Okay. So if you've got a little butterfly sitting here on a leaf, okay, you get up here, it's going to be blurry. It ain't. It, 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 ain't. it isn't going to focus. All right. However, if you press the little flower button, it changes the internal... Uh, focusing of the camera to let you get closer to your subject. Does that make sense? So when you want to take close-ups, think flower button. Okay? I'm sorry, asking? I would guess help. Um, whenever you see question marks in the computer world, it typically means that if I press it, I might be able to get some additional help that comes up on the screen somewhere. That would be my best guess. Otherwise, from a camera perspective, I have no clue. Mm -mm. I bet it's for help. I bet it's some type of a help. And you know what? If you don't know what it is, guess what I'm going to tell you what to do? No, press it. <laughs> and then your camera will blow up, and that will be ended. You know, No, no, no. You know what? And the thing is, There you go. See, so it's giving you help about whatever you're looking at. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yep. No. Uh, and I'm going to talk about scene settings in just a second, but let me answer your question. The flower button will be more of a true close-up then the other one that just had a kind of a silhouette of somebody there. That would be a separate thing. Okay. Now, let me go through a couple more buttons here just to throw them out at you here. Um, a lot of times when you see a little tiny clock, and what I mean by the clock now, and, and I don't know, can you guys see me move my mouse here? In the middle of that, and it's really small, is a circle with sort of like the hand of a clock in it. That's the universal symbol for timer. Do you all know what a self-timer is? It's where you take your camera and you put it on a tripod or, a, or a, a rock or something, okay? And if you turn the timer on by pressing that button, okay, it means that when you press the shutter release, the thing that takes the picture here, you have 10 seconds to run and get into the picture. It's a one-shot deal. So every time you do it, you have to repress the timer button again. Okay, you're also going to notice some of you that when you press the timer button, you will see an option for not only 10 seconds but two seconds. Okay, that's for really really fast people. No, no, I'm being a smart aleck. No, what it's for? Okay, it is for situations where you have a scene that requires a very still camera on a tripod and where even you pressing the shutter will cause camera shake and give you a blurry picture. In those situations, if you turn on the two-second timer, you're giving yourself a two-second lag before the picture is taken. Once you press the shutter, the camera will stop shaking by then, you hope, 
and you get a better picture. That's what that's for. Not that you care, but people always are, what the heck's two seconds? I'm not fast enough for that. So, Okay, now, <clears throat> having said that, one last thing I want to mention to you, and then we're going to talk about some specific camera types of things, and specifically some takeaways here. I want to talk about the zoom for a minute. You all know what zooming is, right? Zooming is, is, is typically in the form of either a button like a rocker switch under your thumb, or a lot of times, I, like on my little camera, it's actually a little circle around the shutter release that I, I can press a little knob back and forth. Do you all know how to zoom with your camera? Do you all know how to do the zoom? Yours is, is a little switch around the, around the shutter. You have a Canon, right? And it should be a little switch that's around, the, you know where you press to take the picture? Okay, it, is there a little ring there? And then there's a little, like a little knob you can press back and forth to zoom in and zoom out. You know, and I'll even show you at break time so that you see where it's at, because it's really important. Zooming is absolutely something you should take advantage of. It's an awesome way to compose pictures, okay? I'm amazed at how many people forget they have it. But the point is this. Your camera has two kinds of zooms. One is called optical, that is good. Good zoom, optical zoom, okay? There's another kind your camera probably has called digital zoom. Digital zoom is also called bad zoom. Now, here's the deal. I'm not gonna be able to tell you with your specific camera how to turn off the digital zoom or how to set it or whatever. You're gonna have to look it up in your book. This is a look up one in your book. But if you look up the word zoom in your book, you'll find it. And in there, they will show you where to go on your camera to turn off the digital zoom, which is what I'm going to tell you to do. Now, why can I be so sure about that? Digital zoom is fake, all right? Instead of using, like if I was going to zoom in on Vince here, okay, so here I'm going to zoom, 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 zoom. Now, I want to get so close that I can just, his whole eyeball is going to fill the screen, okay? Well, I could switch over to digital and do that. But you know what's happening inside the camera? It's not really zooming with optics. It's taking that part of the picture and magnifying it. Now, in the computer world, your pictures consist of little tiny squares, don't they? What, what do we call those little squares? Pixels. That's right. Okay. Guess what happens when you magnify somebody's eye that's made of pixels? You see the pixels, right? And, and sometimes it's called pixelation. Sometimes you see little stair-stepped edges, you know, the jaggies, we call it, all right? Well, that's what optical zoom does. It just magnifies part of the picture. It doesn't truly optically get you closer. Now, pardon me? Yes, yeah, this is digital. So, so what I'm telling you is this, okay? Don't trust me, but do some experimenting on your own. See if you can see with your digital zoom how crummy things begin to look when you get really, really close. I'll tell you what, a long time ago when I was experimenting with this, I did, I did lots of experiments with taking pictures of, of distant things with optical and then digital, going back to my computer and enlarging things. And every time I did it, the best pictures came from me enlarging it myself on the computer rather than digital zoom. Okay. But, but just keep that in mind. Digital is not good, but go ahead and try it yourself and see what you think, okay? All right, I'll get off my pulpit again. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. W, uh, w and T, if you, if you look, and what she's saying is, you know, if you look at where your zoom is happening, you may see the letters W on one side and T on the other as you zoom back and forth. W stands for wide angle. T stands for telephoto. So it's just, those are two terms for you either being zoomed out or zoomed in. That's norm, no. Digital, no. It's just, if you zoom in with the T, you're still optically, you're still, you're still optical. Yep. So it's, it's just purely a zooming term has nothing to do with digital or optical. Okay. Now, I want to, I want to show, t tell you a couple things a couple takeaways that are my favorite things to learn about cameras. And um, I, I'm showing you this slide just to mention to you that your goal is to take good pictures. 
Your goal is to take pictures so that when you show them to your family and friends, they're impressed. Okay? There are features on your camera to help you take better pictures. Now, some of them are pretty geeky. Some of them are for people that really want to get into this. And, and by the way, in our classes, we teach you all of them because sometimes people later want to try them. But here's the deal. There are a couple things you can do today when you go home that will help you take better pictures. And that's kind of what I want to focus on. Okay? And specifically, what I want to focus on is right here. It's called the exposure mode and something that we call uh, programmed scene settings. Okay? So let me jump ahead here. Okay. In the world of photography, your camera can be fooled. All right. Let's say we open up all those curtains over there. And by the way, you webinar people, I'm standing in a room that has the curtains drawn. Okay. So now I'm going to pull back the curtains for a minute. And I'm going to stand over here, this side, and I want to take a picture of you guys now of the entire room, and I'm standing here, and the windows are open over there, how's my picture going to look? Is, am I doing the right thing? No. What, so what's it going to look like? Yeah, I mean, bottom line is, my camera's sitting there, and I'm getting ready to take the picture, and it automatically adjusts how much light's coming in, right? We call that exposure. And it's seeing all this light coming past you to me from the window. So it's thinking, oh my god, there's lots of light. So I'm going to shut things down and not let as much light in. How's that make you look? Dark. And you've, you've all seen this. We've all done it where there's a backlit subject, right? Or another situation, <clears throat> snow. Okay, I know it's July, but you know, snow will come again one of these days probably. So the thing is, when you go outside and take pictures of, of some people making a snowman, there is so much brightness, so much light coming off of the snow that, again, we run into the same situation. If you've ever noticed your snow pictures, notice the people's faces, how dark they are. Same with, with the beach. If you go down to the lake this afternoon, okay, notice how dark people are because of all the reflected light off the lake. And, and I, could name, uh, I could name 50 other examples of where your camera gets fooled. Okay? So here's the deal. In the world of photography, if you know how, if you understand the concept of aperture, which is the opening, and the shutter, which is how long does the camera let the light fall on the film, okay, you can actually make changes yourself to fix things. But do you really want to be that big of a camera geek? Probably not. So here's what's cool. These are computers. We said that already. In the computer world, your cameras now have what are called scene settings. Scene settings are where you tell the camera, this is the scene I'm taking. You adjust yourself for this scene and automatically take my picture. Have any of you ever used scene settings before? A couple of you? How do you like them? Do they work? Yeah. And you know what he said sometimes, and I would absolutely agree with him, okay, because it's not perfect. It is by no means perfect. But I'll tell you what it does, okay? It gives you more of a fighting chance sometimes, right? For example, okay, I'm going to go back to Vince here. Let's say I'm going to take his picture. When I take his picture, as much as I love the people behind him, do I want them in focus? No. I mean, when you take a portrait picture of somebody, Okay, your goal is to get a picture of this person and not have the background interfere with your composition. All right. So in the in the picture world, if I'm a geek photographer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to what are called my aperture settings, and I'm going to change the f f stop setting to about an f16, and I'm going to take his picture because what it will do it will narrow what is called depth of field. Now, how much of that was Greek to most of you? Okay, and I'm not trying to show off, okay? But my point is this, okay, I don't know all those geeky things to do, but here's what I can do. I noticed in my scene settings there's one called portrait. And if I set my scene setting to portrait and take his picture, it's going to do all of that stuff for me without me knowing about it. So, so here's my point, okay? 
you need to find your scene settings. Every, every digital camera has them now. And they're not perfect, like he said. They're not perfect. But I will, I will venture to guess that if you get into the habit of using these scene settings in situations like for portrait, for landscape, backlit, water, uh, snow, so on and so forth, you'll get better pictures. What, what do you got to lose, right? Give it a try. Look for scene settings, OK? Yes, ma'am. This feature, believe it or not, has been around for probably about 10 years. Now, you know what happens is with the older cameras, like I, on one of my older cameras, I have like five scene settings, like just, just real basic ones. On some of the newer cameras, you'll have like 40 and 50. I always make fun of the scene setting for food. There's a scene setting on some cameras for food. Get that, okay? The only thing I can figure for it's like for Thanksgiving dinner when you want to take a picture of the spread, you know? So, so you may just have a few, but they're still useful, even so, okay? All right. Now, i got one more camera thing that I'm going to talk about, and then we're going to take our break. <coughs> okay. Now, I, um, I didn't – hang on just a minute here. Did I put this in here? I didn't put this in your handout, did I? Well, maybe I did. Do you see something in your handout about ISO, low light? Well, if I didn't put it there, I should have. That helps, doesn't it? So I want to, I want to tell you, okay, so, so here's what I want to tell you about, all right? And, and I thought I put it in, but I must not have. I, my, my bad, I'm sorry. Another common picture-taking situation we all run into is where we have to take a picture when there's not enough light, okay? Now, let me ask you a question, okay? If I was going to take your picture right now, all this, this group in here, what do you think of the lighting in here? It, it isn't very good, especially over there. I mean, I've got the light turned off, and so you guys are kind of dark looking. Let me ask you this. When I take the picture, is my flash going to go off? Well, it probably will, but is it going to do any good for those folks that are clear in the back? Uh-uh. My flash is going to be fine for you guys. You're close enough. But for a lot of you who are farther away than about 12 feet, the light just plummets. Flash is a necessary evil. And the reason I say that is because flash is great for, for close-ups of this kind of thing for little groups indoors. But even there, flash is never flattering, is it? It, it tends to flatten us out. It tends to cause red eye. It's, it's flash is evil. Okay? So... What do I do? Well, what I need to do is take what's called an existing light picture. Now, the problem with that is, if I go to, if I turn off my flash, remember we had that little lightning bolt, and if I turn off my flash, okay, and if I go to take a picture here, the problem is my camera is going to try to, to let as much light in as it can, and in the process, it's going to do what's called use a slower shutter speed meaning it's going to leave the camera open longer than it normally would. Now, you know what the problem with that is? Me sitting here like this and you moving around at the same time. Shutter speed determines movement in your picture. The faster the speed, the more chance you have of stopping action. Now, shutter speed is measured in fractions of a second. As a general, general, general rule of thumb, one sixtieth of a second or higher is acceptable for you hand holding a picture. When you go below one sixtieth of a second, however, you are beginning to run the risk of movement and blurriness. Now, I could put my camera on a tripod, couldn't I? That would help. Or, you know what, and I can't get over there because of my microphone here. But what I a lot of times will do is I'll lean against the wall, get my arms in nice and close, support my camera, and take a breath and hold it kind of like I'm shooting a gun, you know? And I can sometimes almost handhold slower speeds because of that. But the bottom line is it's tough. So what do I do? This is where ISO comes in. Do you all remember when you bought film in the old days and the film had a number? 100, 200, 400, 800, so on. Those numbers meant something. And the higher the number, 
the better chance you could take pictures in low light. That's the bottom line. The number represented the sensitivity of the sensitivity of the film to light. High numbers meant film is very sensitive. Low numbers meant it's not very sensitive. But the problem is, with high numbers, you would see more graininess in the picture. So there was a trade-off. So the thing is, if you were going to go down to a concert tonight, you would go out and buy high film, right? Like 800 or 400 or something like that. If you were going to go out to a sunny beach, what would you get? Yeah, like 100 or Kodachrome 25, you know, my favorite, okay? So the thing is, you could adjust that. Now, these cameras have no film, but they still have the number. The number is called ISO. And if you look in your book at home, you will see that you have the ability to adjust that number manually yourself on your camera. When you go into a low light situation like this of any kind, the way you can take a picture is to do this, these steps. One, turn off your flash. It ain't going to do you any good. Turn it off. Number two, go to your camera settings, pop up the ISO to a higher number, and then take your picture. Now, you may have to experiment. You don't want to go to the highest number necessarily because it will still get grainy. They call it noise now, but it's still graininess. So you don't want to go way high, but you can play with the different numbers. And chances are you're going to get a low-light picture without the flash. It'll be tons better than anything else you could do. Now, one final thing I'll mention about this. Some of you who do not, you cannot find the ISO number settings will find in your scene settings, what I just talked about a little bit ago, something called high ISO. Same thing. High ISO is where you want to take an existing light picture without a flash. Okay? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay, so, so again, in, in, in finishing up with the camera stuff here today, my two big takeaways for you, hopefully they'll help you out a little bit, is number one, try your scene settings. Experiment with them and see what you think. I think you'll be pleased with them. Okay? Number two is, in low light situations, don't forget, jack up your ISO. Turn your flash off, turn up your ISO. Okay? Now, as I said before, there's lots of other settings we could talk about. Those, I think, are the, are the most important. If you don't do any of but those, I think you'll help yourself some. Okay, and in our camera classes, we talk about all of them. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break here. Uh, did all of you get your name put in the little basket out there? Did you get your little slip of paper? If you didn't, you still have time to get your name in. We're going to do a drawing right after break. We'll take a little five-minute break here. And after the break, we'll do a drawing for a free class. And I want to kick into the second part of this now, which is basically where we are in the camera. Now we're going to go to the computer. And what I specifically want to show you is one of my favorite new things, a website called Pixlr, which is free, and it's an awesome little photo editor. And so we're going to go up and look at some basic photo editing on the computer. Okay, so let's take a quick break here. And there's coffee, tea in the back. Uh, by the way, there's restrooms down this hallway on the left and also in the big hallway down on your left as well. Okay? And for you webinar people, I'm going to take a quick break here where you're going to hear some silence. Uh, thanks for hanging in here, and I'll be right back. Okie dokie. 
No, I'll try not to do that again. This is so confusing. Um, I have to go left or right. To, oh. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
actually do this in the working with the class more than you might see. I mean, the working with the class, we actually count how our session is. Yeah, and that's the first, and that's the kind of introductory class that the work class will be spoken in more than And I can even talk to you more when I have a class with other people. The basic thing is that I'm going to be speaking to you what we can do in the five settings of this game, which you might call the era. One of them is that full of us here. Now, um, what it sort of boils down to is this half one of our development, depending on what you're doing, could you do more? Then resolution of visibility is important. The reason I say that is because you want to hang your pictures on any kind of device, like a, a screen, whatever. These are very particular, low resolution compared to your print. Your print is going to really have resolution. So if you're talking about sharing a camera wide, you're satisfied. You want to make a video that can be resolution. Now, the first idea is that you can use your hand and find this in your archive. You're going to want to use a high resolution. So there's some things about this though. I tell you what, what we can do is we can get a video of the camera class. Thank <laughs> you. 
Probably are some copies downstairs of those. We just didn't get our table put up. Yep. They're the latest ones we have. Yeah. Hello, webinar people. I hope you're still there. I'm going to be back in action now. I got a few people left. That's good. Um, okay, what I want to do next now is then we, we talked about the camera stuff, which is usually the first step for most people. Okay. 
Now, obviously, there are many other ways to get pictures other than your camera. You have people email them to you, don't you? You have people. You, know, you may go up to a, a photo sharing site like Facebook or Shutterfly or Picasa Web or one of those, and maybe save pictures to your computer. Or we were talking at break time a little bit about scanning pictures. I mean, a lot of you have old prints, negative slides, and guess what? You'd need a scanner to get them onto your computer. So there's there's basically four ways that you get your you can you can get pictures, and we just talked about those four ways right there. Okay. So the thing is this: so regardless of where your pictures came from, your goal is to get them on your computer so that then you can do something with them. Okay, be it share them, edit them, whatever. Now, in terms of getting a, a pictures onto your computer, uh, we cover this in gory detail in our class called Organizing Your Pictures, but we do also cover it in a little bit more abbreviated way in our Working With Pictures class. That's the one that's coming up the soonest after our three camera classes. Okay. But let me just give you a really brief, brief summary of one way that you can get your pictures over. And, and, and sort of maybe you help wrap your brain around where the heck are my pictures in the first place. Okay? Now, where it all starts is, is basically with that camera chip and you somehow connecting this little camera chip to your computer. Now, there's lots of ways to do this. Some of you may, for example, directly connect your camera with the cable that came with it to your computer. Okay? Some of you may actually go out and spend a few bucks, ten, you know, ten bucks on one of these little things called a card reader. This is just simply something you plug into the computer and then it has little slots that you can plug your chip into. Okay? Some of you may actually have built into your computer a slot to put the little camera chip. Like I have a laptop up here that I'm using. And so what I can do is actually I can take out my little camera chip, okay? I have no idea what's on here by the way. I know it's not bad, so we're okay with that. And and over on the side, I have a little plug that I can basically slip this into. And as soon as I do, it has become another connected storage device. It's just like plugging in a flash drive. We talked about that at the beginning of class. Okay, and once I've plugged it in, what I then can do is a lot of times this little window comes up. Does this ring a bell with anybody? Have you ever seen this before, the little autoplay window? Whenever you plug in a storage device, this will typically come up. It's Windows saying to you, hey, you plugged in a storage device. What do you want to do? Now, what we teach in our classes is how to copy your pictures over to your computer and store them manually. And the reason we do that is because this never changes. Even with Windows versions, even with other software, this stays consistent. Okay? So it doesn't take special software, it doesn't take special anything, it just takes the knowledge of this whole file and folder thing, which I know a lot of you cringe at when I say it. Okay? But here's the deal. I am going to open up this folder to view the files. That's what this option is right here. And this is going to open up what's called a standard Windows folder window. Okay? Now, the thing is this. In this folder window, we have, and, and a lot of you probably have seen this before if you're a Windows user. This is, this is, what, this is how you go look at what's on your computer. Okay? And when this window comes up, the left-hand side I'm pointing to here is your navigation. The right-hand side shows you what's inside of whatever you click on over here on the left. Now, here's what's important. When you plug in a camera chip or any other external storage, like a flash drive, your flash drive or camera chip will show up underneath your computer icon as another storage device. See that right there where it says SDMMC? Can you guys see that? That's a little chip I plugged in. It wasn't there before I plugged it in. Okay? The minute I plugged it in, doink, it appears. Now, if I can get to that in this window, I can do anything I want with the files on it. That's the key. 
All right. So if I look at here, this chip has two folders on it. See these two folders here? The one labeled DCIM, that's pretty standard on most cameras. That's what it's going to be. That's where my pictures are. Now, if I didn't know that, I'd just start looking. But I do know that, so that's where I'm going to head. Digital camera something media. I don't know. This is one of those geeky things that I just haven't bothered to memorize, so I don't know for sure. That would be my guess, though. So I'm going to go into it. I'm going to double click. Now, inside of it is where you will see an additional folder. Depending upon your camera, it may be just labeled pics. Or it might actually be a number like mine does. Doesn't make any difference. The point is, guess what's inside of that folder? Pictures. Okay? So I'm going to go double click. Like I say, I don't know what's on here. Oh, there we go. Oh, baseball. Oh, of course, baseball. Okay, so here's the thing. I am looking at the picture files on my camera chip. That's the key. I plug it in. I can get to them. Now, the second big piece of this puzzle is to know, is to learn how to copy them from here to my computer. Okay? Here's the sequence that we used. We first of all, one, make a new folder to put them into. And we name the folder so we can find it again. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay? Now, all of you who have Windows machines for sure, and even you Mac people, have a special master folder that, that, that's good for pictures. What do we call it? Anybody know? Yeah, photos or, and that's what on the Mac side, okay? And my pictures are pictures on the PC side, right? You all know what I'm talking about, okay? Well, I'm going to go up the screen here, okay? And right here is my pictures library, okay? And if I, and, and I know how to use this little menu system here, and again, these are things, you, of course, you have to learn to use. But if I come over here, there's a little arrow next to it saying, oh, there's more stuff underneath it. If I click that arrow, it will expand. See how it expanded? There's my pictures, a little arrow next to it. What's that mean? More. I expand it again. And here's a bunch of folders underneath my pictures. My pictures is the master. I have folders underneath to help me organize myself. That's the key. So how do I organize myself? Well, there's gobs of way to do this. What we do in our classes, okay, is we, and this is something my wife came up with years ago. She likes to organize things by date and subject, okay? So what we typically do, just as an example, is underneath the My Pictures folder, we click on My Pictures, we create a new folder. See where it says new folder right there? If I click on this folder as the master, as the top folder, and then click on new folder, a new one will be created beneath it. That's how you prepare yourself before you copy your pictures over. Make where you're going to put them. Okay, so let's do that. Click. New folder. Waiting for me to name it. I'm going to name it 2014. Bingo. I have a new folder called 2014 underneath my pictures. Would you all agree with that? Now, let's just say that this on this camera chip, there was a baseball game that was on July 4th. Okay? So what I might do then for this under 2014 is make another new folder just for this event. Now, if I've got 10 events on this chip, I can make a folder for each one of those things separately and copy them over separately. And that's what I would normally do, right? So if I've got one game and then I've got a birthday and then I've got, you know, so, but I'm just going to pretend there's one thing here to make it simple today. All right, so I click on 2014, nothing in it, as you would expect. I'm going to make another new folder underneath it. Click. This one I'm going to label, oh, uh, what's July 7? 07 dash. Uh, baseball on title. I made that up. My point is, the way I'm naming this is month number followed by a description of whatever the heck it is. Okay? Now, here's my thought. If I do this, by the end of the year, 
I will have underneath 2014 many, many folders, but because I number them at the beginning, they will be at least in month order, followed by a description of what they are. In our family, we found we can find things later then. This, is, this has been one of our better ways to find things. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's your way to find things. You can come up with your own scheme, okay? This is just one. Point is, you want to make your target of where they're going to go. And it probably is going to be under Photos on the Mac. And actually, iPhoto is going to help you do all this stuff on the Mac. You know, I, your iPhoto program sort of takes control over there. But on the PC side, you're going to do it underneath My Pictures or Pictures, OK? Now, I've got a folder sitting there, right? It's empty. Would you agree with that, everybody? OK? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back down to my pictures here. Here they are. OK? When I am looking at pictures in a folder, one of the things I can always do is change how I'm looking at them. This is called a thumbnail view or a large icon view. Right here, we have a little view button. And the view button lets me change even to a list view. Or I could change to details. I'm not changing what I'm looking at. I'm just changing how I'm looking at them. Okay. Now, sometimes when you're doing stuff like this, it's easier to see thumbnails. So now, I come down here. And I want to take all of these pictures now, and I want to copy them to that other folder. There are many ways to do this. My favorite way, however, for most people is to teach them to copy and paste. How many of you copied and pasted before? Okay. And if you never have, it's a powerful skill to learn. You can use it so many different places. This is just one place. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is this. The first step in copying and pasting is to select to highlight what you want to copy. I've got a whole folder full of pictures here. If I click on one, it selects it, doesn't it? What happens when I click on another one then? Yeah, the first one's not selected anymore, and the second one is. So it's like, how do I select more than one thing? Yes, in the Windows and the Mac world, OK? And in the Mac world, I think you use the Command key instead of Control key. OK? And I don't remember for sure. OK? But in the Windows world, if I hold down the Control key, it's on either side of the space bar. I'm doing that with my finger over here right now. I then can proceed to go click, 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 click. And it's hard to see, but you can see there now I've selected multiple things. Once I've selected them, I can let go. They stay selected. Okay, so there's a little trick for select. And by the way, it works for email, everything. It works for all kinds of stuff. However, if I want to take all of them, there's a handy little shortcut on the keyboard for both the Mac and the PC called Select All. Anybody want to guess how I do that? And I'll give you a hint. It's Control something. A. All. For all. A for all. So, so control A is select all. Okay? So let me do that. Control A. You see them all blue now? Can you kind of see that? It's hard to see. You see that up there? Got them all selected now. Point is this. Once you have them selected, okay, you then can copy them. Now, there's, again, many ways to copy. But usually there is a pull-down menu, either edit that has copy in it, or organize has copy in it, or you could even do control C, copy on the keyboard, which will do it. Nothing like learning like 10 ways and then you forget all of them, right? So the point is, but you got to copy them, okay? So I've got to, again, I've got a control A here. I'm going to go up and just do edit and copy. Now, They've all been put on the clipboard, the, the imaginary, not imaginary, the invisible place where we can put things and then paste them. What do you think I'm going to do next now? Yeah, I'm going to paste them, but where am I going to go first? Yeah, I'm going to go back up to my folder. Here's my newly created empty folder, and I'm going to click on it. Now I'm going to paste. If I come up here, edit, 
paste, boink. There we go. They are being copied from my little camera chip to a folder on my computer. Now, that took us a little time to do, but the reality of it is if you do this a few times, okay, you'll get the hang of it. And the thing is, you may have some software that does this for you automatically. You know, some cameras come with software that just copy them over and they date the folders and all that. And I am not telling you not to do that. If you're happy with that, do it. But also, doing it this way, you now know exactly where they are and you put them exactly where you want to be and you name them exactly what you want to name them. You have more control, I think. Okay? That, in a nutshell, is, the doing, is doing that part. Yes, ma'am. We don't have a class like that. And here's why we don't, is when you say the word album now, you're probably talking about a piece of software that has the ability to create, and I'll put the little quote signs up here, albums. Here, we're, you, we're doing it in folders, so we're dividing them up into folders and things. Albums, though, are what software will call these things, and there's tons of different software that you could use. Now, what we... Then the class that we have called the iPhone and iPad Workshop, Camera, Photo, and iCloud. That's what you want to take, because that's where we talk about that. Yep. Okay, now, I want to, and I know I'm already past my time here, if you guys will bear with me, though. I want now to, to switch gears, then, to the third little phase here of what we call photo editing. Now, in your handout, I have, um, in the back part of it, I've actually got a page or so of, that kind of walks through this, but let me just mention something here. So, once you've got your pictures on the computer, you then can start doing lots of different things with them. You can print them. You can share them through email. You can Facebook them. You can copy them up online to places. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. But one of my favorite things, again, is making them look better. That's called photo editing. Photo editing is basically where you have a piece of software of some kind, you open the picture up, and you make changes to it. Okay? Now, we have classes downstairs that traditionally have used a piece of software called Photoshop Elements. I still use it. It's awesome. If you came up to me and said, I'm really serious about this, I really want to work on pictures, what should I get? I would tell you that software in a heartbeat. But it's not cheap. It, you know, cheap as you probably will find it is 60 bucks. Full retail is 99. Now, for what it does, it's worth it, okay? But I know some of you don't want to invest that kind of money. So what we've now introduced into our classes, in addition to Photoshop, is an awesome online photo editor that's free called Pixlr. And I've got this in your handout. Uh, we've already been teaching classes with it for about the last oh, year, I suppose, and it's worked out really well. I mean, so far it's so good. Now, does it completely replace Photoshop? No. But is it good enough for most people? Yeah. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a real quick tour of it, okay? Just to kind of get, and you could go home and do this when we're done today. So the first thing is, you are going to open up your, your browser at home, whatever you use at home, um, and then you're going to go to www.pixlr.com, and that's P-I-X-L-R. You can see how it's spelled right here. This is what you'll see when you get there. Now, I encourage you at some point to go into the Express and Pixlromatic. These two places are really cool. They have very fun, special effect, fun things to do. But for our purposes today, we're going to go into the good old editor here. Okay? So I'm going to go click. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, here's the editor. Tell me what file you want to work on. Okay, it says, do you want to create a new image? Do you want to open it up or get it from the web somewhere? Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open the image from our computer. Because isn't that probably where your picture is going to be on your computer? Sure, in a folder, and you know where it's at, hopefully. Okay, so I'm going to click on open image from computer. Bingo. Now, it's going to come up with the standard open window. It's going to say, okay, where is it? Find it. 
Now, let's just for the heck of it, um, I could go to the pictures I just copied over, but I've got some sort of, uh, uh, I've got some, what do I want to call them? I don't want to call them setup pictures. It's like where I already know what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> uh, but I could, you know, go over here to my pictures, 2014, there's a baseball game, and I could choose something from here if I wanted to. Okay, but what I'm going to do instead is over on my desktop, I think, I hope I put it over here, I have some pictures that I that we kind of use in class sometimes. Here we go, picture seminar. So I'm going to pull something from here. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the picture and open it up to edit it. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and use this uh, picture here about these hot air balloons. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it and then I'm going to click open. And that's going to open it up inside my photo editor. Now remember again, here's the key thing here. This is entirely on the internet. This is not software you download, this is a web page you're working with. The danger of that is, is that once you've opened a picture and you start making changes to it, if you suddenly close the browser window, you've lost all your changes. Okay. So that part of it's a little bit dangerous. Good news is you don't screw up your original picture. It's fine. It's, it's safe and sound. You're working on a copy. You've uploaded a copy that you're working on. Okay? Now, in your handout, I talk about a thing called workflow. Workflow is simply a series of typical steps that you take to enhance and fix your picture. There are two kinds of workflow. There's one I call the quick and dirty workflow, which is basically the kind you use on your day-to-day -day stuff, stuff you just want to get out the door. You took 10 pictures at a birthday party. You want to get them over to Facebook. Okay? This kind of workflow takes about a minute per picture if you get good at it. The other kind of workflow is the same, but you, you vastly expand the enhancement part of the workflow. This is the kind of picture where you've got the old family picture from the turn of the century with that crease across the guy's face and things like that, where you're willing to spend literally an hour if you need to or more fixing the picture. In either case, though, the workflow is the same, and you can see it's your handout. Step number one is you open up the picture. Now, step number two, save the picture as a TIFF. You don't do that with Pixlr. You don't have to because you're using a web editor. Okay, so in those steps that I have listed, the step that says to save your picture right away as a copy so that you're not screwing up your original is not valid with Pixlr. You're already working on a copy. Does that make sense? If you were at home on your photo editor like, like Photoshop, then you'd want to save your picture and continue working on a copy of the picture. Okay. All right, so with Pixlr, though, we skip that step. So now we're ready to work on it. Now, in the realm of workflow, the next things you want to do are the physical things first. Does the picture need to be rotated? That's the first thing you look at. Now, let's pretend this one does. It doesn't, right? But it, let's say it does. So rotating, you'll see it on this, on, in this program. Let me move this over a little bit. You have at the top of the screen pull-down menus. You have a toolbar on the left and you have little panels on the right and then your picture is in a floating window in the middle okay to rotate this picture we are going to go up to the pull down menus and there are two in particular that you'll spend most of your time in the image menu has all of the rotating stuff it also has a sizing option the adjustment menu has all the fix up stuff the color the brightness, the contrast, all those things. So these two menus are the most important of the two. Okay. Now we're going to go to image and we're going to come down to rotate. A lot of times when you take pictures, you'll take them instead of like this, you'll take them like this. right? And in that case, it's going to be sideways when it comes up here. So you need to rotate it 90 degrees one way or the other. Simple to do, isn't it? Come into this menu, click on 90 degrees counterclockwise or counterclockwise, doink, and there it goes. It turned it. Now, you're saying, oh my God, we lost part of the picture. Well, no, you didn't. Because basically when this got turned, it just ran out of space to show the whole thing. And that leads me over here to the corner. You see where I'm moving my mouse here? 
This little window over here called the navigator is where you can zoom out and zoom in on your picture. I'm sliding the little bar at the bottom. So I can zoom it back out to see the whole thing. When I'm zoomed in, I have a little thumbnail with a red box on it that's draggable. And I can drag it to different positions on if I want to work on things. Okay? It's a cool little bar, really. All right, I'm going to zoom back out again. There we go. So I can rotate. That's the point. So I rotate. Now, if I didn't like what I did, if I, let's just say I didn't really need to rotate, so I need to undo this. Is there an undo button? It's like, oh my gosh, there's no undo button. But instead, we have in the corner here history. See this little box down here? This will show you step after step after step of everything you do. And all you have to do to undo something is go backwards in it. So you see where it says open image? And this said rotate. If I simply click back one step, it's like undoing. And this will go all the way through. When I do stuff, I get a whole list of history that I can go back and forward to if I screw things up. All right, so we rotate. The next physical thing we typically do is crop unwanted parts of the picture. Now let me zoom in a little bit here. Okay, let's just say I want the big balloon. Over on this little toolbar here has all kinds of stuff on it. Don't worry, you hardly use any of them, just a handful of them, just a couple of them, okay? But one you use is called the crop tool. It's up in the upper left-hand corner right here. To crop this picture, we drag out a crop box, okay? So here's my mouse. I'm going to go to the upper corner of this, and I'm going click, drag, and you see the little rectangle that's appearing as I drag it? And then when I let go, I'll see this. It's called the crop box. I can adjust it. I can make it bigger or smaller. I can go to little corners. I get double-headed arrows, and I can drag this and drag it, and I can adjust it to exactly the way I want it. To finish the crop, I just point my mouse at the middle of it, and I go double-click, and it's cropped. So my point is this. Workflow, you rotate, and then you crop your picture accordingly. Okay? Now, I'm going to undo that again because I like both, both balloons. <laughs> okay? Now, the next step then is the enhancement part. This is the part that we could spend hours on or seconds on, depending on what we want to do. What we always do, though, in this step, regardless of the picture, is we try to adjust the exposure of the picture. Now, you guys have all heard of brightness and contrast. Maybe you've even used a little brightness and contrast at a kiosk at Walgreens or on your computer at home. Brightness and contrast is fine, but it's not very good, really. Okay? Instead, we want a tool that lets us adjust things more precisely, and this program has it. And it's awesome, and it's called Levels. Okay? If we go to the adjustment pull-down menu and we slide down to levels, see that word right there, levels, okay? I used to tell people it was worth buying Photoshop Elements to get this because Photoshop Elements has this. It was worth the price, okay? Because when you open it, what it allows you to do, it allows you to individually adjust the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones, okay? Now... Without getting too geeky here, let's just learn how to use this in a simple way. This little graph, you see a little graph over there? Okay. This little graph right here is called a histogram. All right. The left-hand edge is pure black. The right hand is pure white. And this graph shows you through the bumps how many pixels there are at different levels of brightness. Now, who cares? What you want to know is simply how do I use this? All right. Your perfect picture, the graph will spread from edge to edge. Now, does this graph spread from edge to edge? No, so there's something wrong with it. Okay? To fix this picture, you want this to spread from edge to edge. You need to go underneath it to these three little uh, square things. Okay? All you have to do is this. You either go to the, to the, to the dark one or the white one first and you slide it in to the end of the graph. Then you go to the opposite one and do the same thing. 
And then while you're eyeballing the picture, you slide the middle one back and forth. Now, this is really, the middle one is really called the contrast slider. Okay? And if you slide it to the right, you get more contrast. If you slide it to the left, you get less contrast. Okay? So, do you see what I did there? I simply went into the end here, into the end here, eyeballed it, slid this back and forth. Life is good. Now, I'm going to click OK. Let me go back in time to show you what it was before. So here's the before, there's the after. You know, and the thing is, I've got other pictures that are even more dramatic than this, but here's my point. Every picture you even take on your digital camera can stand some of this. Even, I don't care what kind of a, a digital camera you have, whether you've got a really expensive digital SLR or a little tiny $25 point and shoot. The fact is, Levels is something that your camera will attempt to adjust itself, but oftentimes doesn't quite get there. And so even those pictures can stand a little bit of this, and it makes an amazing difference when you use it. Okay? Levels. Biggie. Now, having done levels, that's the first thing you do. Next thing you would do is red eye reduction. Yeah, Vince? Yes, the whole picture. Yeah, the whole, it affected the whole kit and caboodle. Yep. Now, the next step you do then is red eye reduction. Now, I don't have red eye. I don't need it here, do I? Red eye, though, can simply be done very simply. There's a button over here called the red eye button. You see my mouse moving? And if I click on it, all I have to do is go to somebody's face with my little crosshair, and I click on the red of their eyes, and it fixes it. That's how simple that is to do. So you can imagine if I had somebody here, you could see that happen, but I don't, okay? And then the third thing that I like to do in, t in terms of the quick and easy, get it out the door stuff, is a little bit of sharpening. Now, sharpening in this program is very simple, and it's the one thing that I wish they would give us a little bit more capability on, but here's the deal. If you go to the filter menu, there's all kinds of filters on blurring and sharpening and kaleidoscope and all kinds of junk down here, okay? But there is a sharpen right here, sharpen, okay? This is a simple one-click, do-it kind of thing. Most pictures off of your brand new digital camera can stand a little bit of sharpening. Digital cameras tend to take soft pictures. And by sharpening it just a little tiny bit, you get a little bit more a uh, little bit more of, of edge sharpness that really looks good or really makes a difference when you print things. Not so much on the screen, but really when you print. And if I click here, sharpen, you're hardly going to be able to see anything on this screen here. But it did sharpen a little bit. And if you were to print out before and afters, you could see it. You'll have to trust me on this one. Okay? All right. So I did those. That's it. I'm done. That's my workflow. And can you see how I could do this in a minute? I mean, if I was just not talking here, all right? The last thing I do then is I'm going to go to Edit, and I'm going to Save, okay? Actually, not Edit. I'm going to go to File, which is way over there. And I can hardly see it. I'm going to go Save. Okay. Now, in since we are doing this on the web, you have to keep in mind that it's going to be a little tiny bit different than doing it on your own computer at home. There's one additional little step, which you see right here, which is... Okay, you want to save it. What kind of picture do you want to save? And if you look at this menu, there's JPEG, PNG, BMP, TIFF, and so on and so forth. Now, here is one little takeaway for you. You've all heard of JPEGs, right? JPGs. It's the kind of computer picture file your camera takes. Okay, so it's the most common thing you run into. When people email you, you probably are getting JPEGs. But there's a problem with JPEGs. Okay. The problem is, every time a picture is saved as a JPEG, it's compressed. That's what JPEG is so awesome at, compressing them, making them smaller to send on the Internet. Okay. But when it compresses, it throws things away. It does what's called lossy compression. So every time you save and you save and you save, quality slowly seeps away which means that as you save your awesomely fixed up picture here, do you think JPEG is the best way to save it? No. If this is for archival purposes, you know, this is for posterity, you're going to want to choose either TIFF, which is what we like to use, or this other one called BMP. Okay? 
Now, the reason I say either one of these is this. Normally, I would say to you, TIFF, 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 TIFF. It's universal. Max can open it. PCs can open it. It's been around forever. TIFF is awesome. Full quality. You know, I, you know why I don't say TIFF with Pixlr? Pixlr can't open TIFFs up. You believe that? You can save as a TIFF, but later if you want to fix it some more, you can't open it up. They must not have bought the license or something, you know? So, <laughs> and I had a student discover this, actually. I didn't, I didn't even discover it. I had a student find this out for me and let me know about it. So here's the deal. When you are using Pixlr, if you save it as a TIFF, that's great unless you want to make changes, more changes with Pixlr. Then you got a problem. So what I would maybe do is instead use what's called BMP. BMP is just like TIFF. It's, it's Microsoft's way of doing things. Even Macs can open up BMPs, even though they're Apple versus Microsoft, okay? So it's, it's another really good format, and Pixlr can open them, okay? So that's photo editing. That's what we mean by photo editing, okay? And if you look at the whole realm of things that you want to do with your pictures, you know, you may not decide to do this on a day-to-day -day basis, all right? But on the other hand, this is something that a lot of people are getting into just to come up with better looking pictures. And you can impress your family and friends by doing this, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, so, and, and I didn't finish it and I should have. So I chose BMP, and I'll just use BMP. I check OK. Now it's going to open up a window and say, where do you want to save it to? So this is where I'm now going to save it to my computer from up there on Pixlr. And I could choose whatever folder I wanted to, you know. Uh, I'll go ahead and go into my pictures folder, and we'll just say that this was a baseball picture that we did earlier. There's baseball. There's, I could name it whatever I want to here. I could say fixed balloons. I'll re spell balloons. There's two L's in there. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. There we go. That is now a file sitting in my baseball folder, <laughs> even though it's balloons, sitting in my baseball folder called balloons, fixed balloons. Okay. All right. So, so here, you know, let me let me just finish with this. And so, the whole thing is with this all of this digital photography stuff is that, you know, we now have things we could never do before without a darkroom, without a fancy dancy camera. You know, how far you want to take this is totally up to, going to be up to you. You know, some of you may be satisfied with just some simple things. Some of you may want to go knee deep in this. Who knows? Um, certainly, our classes are geared toward all of you that way. Um, like even in the camera class next week, even though we talk about all kinds of stuff, you're going to take away just what you want to use. That's the point. Okay. Same way with the editing classes and the working with pictures classes. We'll try to teach you as much as we can. You'll take away what you think you need and want to do. And that's always the way things work. Okay. Anybody have any, cl any questions about anything that we talked about today or classes or anything? Yes, sir. Right. Did everybody hear his question? It's a really good one. So let's just say you've got you got a thousand pictures on your camera chip. You just need to get them over to your computer, right? And you don't want to sort them right now. You're going to sort them later. Well, the good news is that regardless of whether you're coming from a camera chip or from another folder, you can always organize them later. And so what I would probably do is still go to the pictures folder, and underneath it maybe, maybe create a folder called to sort later or something. And then I would just take every one of those pictures, select them all, and copy the whole kit and caboodle into that folder. And then you can always come, and, and I've done that. I mean, I have, I have some folders that are sort of like that, that I just didn't want to take the time to screw with them. And I just threw everything into it, and then I'm, someday I'll come back to them. But at least then you have them on your computer, and then you free up your camera chip, you know, and life can go on. So, good question, really good question. Yes, ma'am. And that you should get a higher number of 
Oh, um, if you're referring to the, okay, a lot of the newer media cards not only will have a size indicator on them, like it'll be so many gigabytes, okay? So you'll have like a 4 or 8 or 16 or 32. And of course, the higher the number, the more pictures you can get. But some of them will also have what's called a, um, the name is eluding me here. It's a, it's not a type number, but it's a number that represents the speed of the memory in the card. And so you'll see some of them that are 4 and some are 8, and then 10, I think, is the highest one. The answer to that is, in all honesty, yes, the higher numbers mean the pictures will transfer faster, but if the cost for that card is very much, it's, it's not enough to make a much of a difference to you, to most people. So in other words, if you have 1,000 pictures, instead of taking maybe two minutes to copy, it'll take one minute but you've just paid 20 bucks more for that card. Is it worth it to you? So, so just keep that in mind is yes, those higher numbers are better for speed, but they're not necessarily going to make a huge difference for you. Okay, yes sir. After you transfer your pictures into your, do uh, you usually you delete them off your camera? Yeah, and so what I didn't show you there, and I should have, is once I've got them where I want them to go, we saw that, right? You saw them copy. And we know they're there. Then I go back to the camera chip. I select them again and press delete on my keyboard, which will delete them from the camera chip. My whole thing with copying them, meaning duplicating them, is that you make sure they're there before you go back and delete them from the card. So, so yes, my short answer is absolutely you'd go back later and just delete them from your camera chip. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes. You took the abbreviated version. <laughs> and so what will happen is you basically got the first two and hardly any from the last one. So if your answer is question is, would it be worth it? Yes. And so you'd want to come to the last one as a separate class. Now, you could also retake the first ones as retakes, too, if you felt like it. But yeah, it, it would kind of work that way. So yeah, you're thinking right. The last one would be something that you probably haven't had much of. So, Hey, well, thank you all for coming today. And uh, we have another session tomorrow morning at 10 called Technology. And it's where we do Facebook and we do all the other junk, iPads, iPhones, and all that kind of thing. And it's well, we got about 50 people signed up, but you're still welcome to come if you'd like to. And for you webinar people that still hung in there, Harold, you still hung in there. Good for you, buddy. And Sharon and Howard and Stephen, but he has no choice. And Ed, thanks for coming today. And sorry we had the little glitch earlier. Uh, hopefully, you know, you get, you found something out or you, you got something out of this. So thank you guys a ton. And we have another webinar tomorrow morning I think some of you might be signed up for. And hopefully it will run smoothly. So thanks a lot again for coming, you guys. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to close the window here in just a moment. But thanks again for coming.
being like, oh, you can be here Monday. No, I'm just being sad. He might have gone down like to talk to me or to say hi to me. You know, he might have been asking the front desk if he went by to you were doing. Okay, so let me just pretend here for a minute. Let me get over here to let me stop this once here.